What's going on, everybody? This is another episode of the show. I don't think we need to know. No, wait. What? I don't think we need to tell you anymore what we are. But then again, if you don't know, we are the Everything Horror Podcast, and you are listening to Paul Dolsky with the lovely fiance. Tessa Baker. And this is another interview with a very interesting Canadian. Ha ha. Interesting. Hmm. Well, anyways, let's uh, introduce you to Douglas. Oh, man, I probably should have asked you this before we even started uh, Started this. Is uh, Douglas Ewan, I want to say, is your, how you pronounce your last name? Yeah, you're probably one of the first people to say it right. Wow. Okay. I, I, I want to take this honor for a minute and uh, just want to thank all the people that ne- never doubted me for one thing. No, I'm joking. Anyway, it's not about me. But yay, congratulations to me. Anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, so Douglas, uh, welcome on board. And how Canadian weather, by the way? Well, I'm sort of northern Ontario, so we still have snow. Still a bit cold, below zero, anyways. Still winter. Holy shit. And I thought we were bad, but uh, let's see. It is 72 degrees here with sunny, if you can believe it. It is gray and shitty and <laughs> minus five Celsius. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. Um, well, we had, the gray, brutal. we had the gray weather yesterday, that's for sure. We thought it was going to rain or something at one point. That's for sure. It rained yesterday, then it snowed today, and we're supposed to get one more snowfall before it's supposed to be. We get about eight months of winter here. Holy shit. That's no fun. No, it's not. The summers are nice, but then you have to endure eight months of shit, and then it's nice for three months, and then one month of odd, you don't know what it's going to (laughs) do. Ah, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, So, anyway... We're on to talk about the film that I reviewed for you that you wrote and directed, if memory serves me right, even after refreshing, I'm still trying to remember. Too much shit going on to remember. But anyway, uh, yes, you wrote and actually had a co-writer as well and directed this independent film or short film, I should say, um, called Bipolaroid. and. Correct. And can you tell us a little bit of a synopsis of this? Because unfortunately, uh, you know, there's not really one online. But for those that are listening to help understand what we're going to be talking about. Well, Bipolaroid is a, uh, like you said, a short film. It was my first film in film school. Um, It's about, basically about me in a way. I uh, live with bipolar disorder one and... A lot of people used to tell me that it com- it, with mental illness, you get creative in the industry. And they tell me all these actors and directors. And then they found out I made a lot of horror movies and maybe a little bit scared. So what the movie is about is just, it's about a man who finds beauty in things that a lot of people find are horrific. Maybe the situation is not as best. And it's his lens that he's looking through, which in the movie actually represents a camera lens. But just his lens on the world, what he finds beautiful, what other people may find disgusting. Right. And it's very short and interesting, and you just need to pay attention a little bit, too, if I may say, because um, I want to say at one point, which I kind of now, after re-watching it again, kind of makes me wonder if I even saw it the first time. It was the part with the uh, lady that was getting ready for the photo shoot and I noticed on her back this time there was almost like a um like a horse print or some type of weird marking almost that this like maybe like a horse stepped on her or something happened to her because she was just like really looking at it and then I don't know if I like I said if I caught it the first time but then when she's out in the photo shoot and as you're saying the guy is there looking at her being uh, beautiful, and then at the lens is taking it, you start to get this dark vibe with the, um, I'll say, like, the darkness of 
seeing it through the Wend perspective, I want to say, which is like uh, there's one part where I want to say it's the lady's hand um, on the ground, and you kind of see like a skeleton hand as well, who, which is like reaching out for her hand and some other cr creepy stuff, and then you see the ending, which I don't really want to go into because for people that have yet to see this, I don't want to spoil too much, but it is quite quite interesting. Tessa, what do you think of the... Yeah, it's still, still running the film festival circuit right now. There's a few more to go, wait for to see if I was selected or not, but basically, that's yeah, when she's changing the room, and she has a disfigurement on her, on her body, and then later on in the film, even though it's very short, you find that she's a model, and that's why the the theme of everyone wears a mask that she has her own problem she's has her own physical image of herself but on stage she's someone that is supposed to represent beauty but to herself she may not feel that way and yeah there is a pretty dark creepy vibe um don't get the impression that i'm a dark creepy person in real life i am canadian so still nice but yeah no the, the video itself yeah it comes off uh, i was trying to go more experimental than narrative um and the point was to keep it under five minutes. It's just with festivals, it's easier for them to put it in blocks before these people start making 20, 40-minute films that don't really find a place within the festival. And with my previous experience, I just always, I try to keep it short when I do short films. Well, that's always a good thing. Um, just real quick, uh, so Tessa, when you were watching The Bipolaroid, what did you think of the film in general? I, I actually thought it was very interesting. It was a very um, creative take on portraying the the dark subject of the dark bipolar. subject of Bible. Yeah. I thought it was pretty creative in how you portrayed it, to be honest. Well it's it's not that I wanted to represent the actual you know, give people the idea that by everyone that's bipolar lives this absolutely dark, creepy life or everything in their minds all fucked up they it's just when people speak to me and they find out the like the genre i'm into the type of films that i make and then they find out that particular part of me exists that i do have that i live with being bipolar they tend to uh put the two together when i don't find that really to be the case well you did mention we all wear different yes. masks and stuff and uh and then especially at the end where the narrator says, like, um, I can't remember exactly how it's worded, but it's like, well, this is who I am or this is me or something like that, which is understandable. But then again, like, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't think Tessa meant to say, like, it I represents. didn't mean to say it like that. I, I'm just oh, no, 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 no. Trying to. I, I didn't I didn't take it like that. <laughs> no, but for somebody that may be listening, might like be like, uh, I'm not saying anything to openly offend anybody on this subject. No, and I mean, no, welcome, welcome to 2019, where you have to <laughs> put a disclaimer at the end of everything. Where no, I, it, it's just at the end of it, what it's pretty much saying is that I don't make these films because I'm bipolar. This is actually who I am. This is what I like. This is what I create, and this is the genre I chose to explore. Nice, yeah. yeah, and and I mean, I know a couple people in my lifetime that I definitely knew that had bipolar, and I mean, kind of like with the way your short film portrayed it, with the whole the the medicine and shit. The narration mentioned like three things, and I forgot to write them down. The um. What was it? Uh, sanity, sanity, depression, and something else, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Illness and disorder. Yeah. And at first, when I was watching this film, I was just like, hmm, okay. Take, we see, like, you know, he kind of already bloodied up and taking these pills to swallow right before he does the photo shoot. And, but then I, I kind of like the interesting twist at the end. And that's all I'm going to say. And uh, It was definitely an interesting twist. Oh, yeah. It, I, it was a good tw little twist for the four-minute and, I believe, ten-second video. But 
for so Doug, if you don't mind me asking, um, when was like the first time you knew you had you learned that you had bipolar, and how did you like oh. you know, deal with it? I, I was quite young. I was, uh, I mean, I so I was fifteen in what two thousand. So about ninety eight, uh, it wasn't really a uh, thing that they diagnosed correctly right away. So for the first little while, it was just issues with you know maybe being too excited or ADHD or things of that nature. And then eventually, I was diagnosed around seventeen eighteen, and I mean it was hard at first because you have to experiment a lot of medication to get yourself balanced out. But it's not really anything to be scared of. A lot of people do live normal lives being bipolar. I know a lot of people actually have crippling bipolar. I mean, mania is not an easy thing to deal with and now there's depression, so I'm not by any means making it sound like it's a breeze, but no, I, I have found I have a really good support system. My parents were always great. Um, I never had it, like, when I was on my own at times, it was hard when I was getting older and living on my own, but no, but growing up, my parents were always there for me and helping me and made sure they are always around and they understood and they kind of already knew that I was a different kind of person and the biggest part was was explaining to people there's a difference between being an asshole and being bipolar because a lot of people um, I'm sarcastic I have kind of a dark sense of humor and I would say things and people would be like oh that's 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 crazy and I'd be like well I mean that's not anything to do with my mental illness I'm just really sometimes an asshole so I would have to explain that to people at first because once people find that aspect about you they tend to uh, easily judge or they think they know who you are right away. Yeah, they So that was probably the hardest. But other than that, I mean, ups and downs. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like they were judging the book by its cover way too early, really. Um, I didn't know if you heard me say that. But, <clears throat> um, you know, I mean, it's, 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 I always find it fascinating with how once somebody knows that they have bipolar and, you know, so many different people have different ways of, what's the word I want to say, like, I guess cope with it, like how to not make it so bad and where it's under control and it's not always exploding, I guess I want to say. Um, I mean, there's there are times where I even think I have like a small bipolar Thing within me, a lot of people even thought I did, and I have yet to even know what I even do. But I mean, there are days where I don't know if it's just my, just me, just being annoyed or what. But next thing I know, I'm like snapping at everybody, and then I'm right back to being normal. And it's just like, hmm, I don't know what this is all about. But maybe I'm just, I don't know. Um, like I said, too annoyed with what's going on. But, yeah, I'm not a particularly easy person to work with, so a lot of people try and tiptoe around that as well. Not that I get angry or snap, but I, I don't know. I expect a certain amount of creative perfection when I'm doing things where other people may not share the same view as me. I, I don't know. I don't find, like, living, like, just how um, your wife there was saying, how oh, you shouldn't want to offend anyone. That's the problem with me in 2019. It's being bipolar and being who I am, maybe not having the best filter, it's a little bit hard to live like that at times, but I get by. Yeah. I seem to be the, uh, not, not the outcast by no means, but I don't know. I have a different view on a lot of things than a lot of people. Like I remember I was explaining to someone with text messaging the other day, when LOL actually meant laughing out loud and now you actually have to put it at the end of a sentence just so they uh, don't take what you're saying that seriously because you're always scared that you're going to offend someone. So basically every message I send has LOL at the end and people just thought I was always laughing when really I was just putting that as like a little disclaimer like don't be offended by this but really I do mean this. So <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's things like that that I get judged on but other than that, no, it's uh, it comes and goes. I mean... I allow people to judge. I allow people to do what they want. It doesn't really affect me anymore. At first, I was kind of sensitive about it, but now I just uh, do me and let them do them. And if it gets in the way, then that's about it. I've never really had any problems on set or working with people where that actually interfered. I, I'm able to pull myself away if I know something's happening and i got to take a break for a while. So it doesn't interfere with work. It doesn't interfere with movies. So as long as I keep it under control, I get by pretty good.
Yeah, you had, you you brought up a uh, old story that um, that happened with me one time where this person didn't know if I was trying to be a jokester or serious because of the way I said it and then how I didn't laugh afterwards or anything. My kid response was like, uh, I don't know if you're being serious or if you're j or that was a joke. Um, uh, and then my response was just like, mm, take it the way you want. <laughs> like, kind of like, well. Yeah, that's basically how I fly by through life. People will stare at me for a bit. And even with my girlfriend, my family, too, they will they can't tell what's like, are you being serious right now? Or, you know, and that's what I try to explain to people. Like, there's a difference between being an asshole and being bipolar. Like, yeah, there are times where I'll say something sarcastic or rude, and they're like, are you are you being serious? I'm like, oh, that's, that's kind of joking, but now I'm with you. I'm at the point where it's like, take it how you want it. I mean, everything is so sensitive nowadays, it's it's hard to really say anything without offending people. Yeah, yeah. We, we I don't really like the generation that we became, or generation that we're going into, I guess, per se. I think we're a lot older than some of these uh, people who started the, uh, Oh my God, this is too offensive. Blah, blah, blah. And, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I just, I just don't care if I offend somebody or not, unfortunately, but, uh, that's just, as the, as the movie puts it, that's, that's just who I am. So, yeah. In this case, that's like what you said too, Doug. Yeah, I was having, uh, an interesting conversation with someone earlier that even as early as five years ago, you were able to touch on subjects like, um, like there was a lot of movies that revolved around sex and violence and like almost like desire versus terror where a man and a woman, you know, maybe he would be a little bit forceful, but maybe she'd be playful. And now, it, you know, it's not, not that I'm saying, you know, you know, no means yes or anything like that, but that was a topic that was able to be said about five years ago in a lot of movies. And now it's, uh, just don't bring that up. And in a lot of my new films and a lot of stuff that I've been working on, it's kind of along the lines of the dark side of people. My next one actually wasn't really a, I would say, a horror film. It was more of a nightmarish drama um, that's going to be released. And it's still a short film um, that I'm still editing, actually. That's what I was mixing before I was doing this. And it is it is hard. It's, it's really hard not to say the things that you want to say at the same time when you're trying to market yourself, especially on social media. And I don't know. Yeah, you're right. You just gotta. You just have to be yourself and go go along. Try not to say anything too offensive. But at the same time, you know, 2019, they're trying to find a villain and they can't because every time they find one, they just end up destroying them and ruining their career. So I have no problem being that next person. <laughs> I'd be right there with you. Um, so. How long did it take you and your co-writer to write your short film by Polaroid? Well, Frank, Frank Wabi, he, uh, he is a fellow film student. I'm, I'm a mature student, and um, it's actually an interesting story how I even started school. But um, he, he, is, he went to the Canadian Film Institute, and uh, he went to, I believe... Oh, Christ, I don't remember, but he, he's, uh, I wrote, I wrote the film. Now, unfortunately, being bipolar, as now, I'm pretty calm, but when I get on with talking or I get into something that heats me up, I will tend to just continue to talk. So when I write, I write like I talk, and at times when you're reading a script, it's supposed to be more um, direction, almost like technical, like a, it's like a map to a movie. So I'd write this piece, and then I'd give it to Frank, and Frank would fix it up and give it what it needs, and... And that's how we've kind of developed this relationship. He helped me on the next one, and uh, he's going to help me on the feature that we're doing. And he, uh, yeah, he, more of a co-writer and the guy that says, this is probably just a little too much right here. So let's, let's tone this down a bit. But, uh, no, he keeps me in check. And about, I probably had that written months before I even started school, and I just touched up a bit. Um, I tend to always be writing. So I always, I always have something. And like I said, Frank fixes it up. He's a uh, he's a very talented writer, actually. So, yeah, no, I, I he he actually is an action buddy action comedy guy. 
So when he reads my stuff, he always like he'll he'll read it and read it, and then by the end he goes, and there's Doug. And especially in the last one too, he thought it was a drama, and then once we went to the end of my original script, he was like, oh my god, you can't, no, no, let's change that up. So he had to fix it up for me a bit, and yeah, he just keeps me in check. I don't have a hard time writing; I just tend to put my all into it, which is nice. Cause I do the same thing when I'm on set, but at the same time handing your script over to your DP or handing, going through a shot list and you already have all these visuals in mind and then your DP and your producer and everyone's looking at this script and they're thinking like, this this is just craziness on paper. And I tend to write a lot um, with pen and paper. I don't use a computer right away. So then I also start writing these Illuminati maps where this goes here and this goes there and triangles and squares when you have to do. Other people just are confused, and the next thing you know, Frank is able to put it together in words. So he's a very big asset to my team, that's for sure. Hmm. Now, real quick, uh, Doug, is what what actually got you into uh, the horror genre? Well, that... <laughs> um, okay, so my brother is 10 years older than I am. So... A lot of my childhood, you can not, I wouldn't say he tortured me, but I mean, he made sure that I was seeing a lot of adult content when I was really young. So I remember he was watching Friday the 13th, and I was watching and thinking, like, this isn't really scary. This is just kind of, you know, interesting. I'm trying to figure out who the killer is, trying to go all this. And then you find out, and then the ending comes where he pops out of the water and absolutely scared the shit out of me. And then we started watching, like, Evil Dead. We started getting that. I'm about, I don't know, six, seven years old. And then he introduced me to RoboCop, and which is still to this date probably my favorite movie. Um, yeah, prob probably my favorite. I mean, I uh, who directed it there? Paul, Paul, what's his name? Paul Vorhoven. Vorhoven. There you go, Paul Vorhoven. He, uh, yeah, I followed him for a long time in his career. And one of my favorite directors is Canadian. He's probably my favorite, David Cronenberg. I watched a lot of his films, but when I was younger, I lived up north in a very small community, and there's about a thousand people in this place. It was absolute. If you didn't play hockey, or you didn't play hockey, you didn't belong in the society. So basically, I was an indoor kid. All I did was watch movies, play video games, write, read. Comic books was a big part of my life. And then I met this um, friend of mine. He's about three years older than I was. His name is Michael Welnick. It goes by Stosh. And then he, at a young age, which was odd, he was um, more into like the Lynchian, Kubrick kind of style of movies. And uh, we, I mean, we still watched a lot of like Clyde Barker and Lord of Illusions came out. We were all into that kind of shit. But he introduced <laughs> me to that. And I found that to be more horrific than I did these slasher films of the 80s. I mean, to me, those were just fun. Like, I'd just like come home, hope to God my brother was watching something where there was a bunch of killing in it. Uh, my parents were very, I don't know, liberal, I guess. they. Uh, I mean, they weren't like not give a shit parents, but they definitely were like, you know what, Like, we don't think you're going to grow up to be a hockey mask wheeling serial killer, so we'll allow you to watch this, type parents. So those movies were fun to me, whereas I'd watch like Lost Highway or I'd watch Dead Ringers or things of that nature, and I'd be like, holy shit, like, these movies are allowed to be made. Like, there are people that are allowed to make this kind of crazy ass stuff that people don't get, but when you really think about it, this is this is terrifying. So that's what really opened my mind. Uh, I owe a lot to him, actually. He uh, Stosh there. He he's the one who probably was my main influence in film, let alone the horror genre. He introduced me to everything. I think his family is a little more wealthier than mine, so I think he bought I don't know twenty movies a week that we just sit there and watch every single every single weekend. So that was my introduction. It was from my older brother with the Friday the 13th, Evil Dead. And then when I moved to the city, I had a friend who was absolutely obsessed with Nightmare on Elm Street. And he actually had one of those six-foot Freddy Krueger life-size, I don't want to say doll, but it, it was robotics. When you walk by, it would say, no running in the hallways, just like the movie. That. So, I mean, my whole life, every time I meet someone, they're always in the same things that I was, and I just kept going with it. And... Yeah, I just, I really enjoy it. Now I'm more into, like, character studies, like, I, um, Taxi Driver. I'm just recently, like, The House That Jack Built, stuff stuff like that, like, more art piece, horror, experimental, things like that. I mean, I would love to make a slasher flick. I, 
I dream of doing that one day. I love making sure that someone dies in every one of my movies. <laughs> or I don't have fun. Not the good way to look at it. Uh, Tetha actually had a really funny story when it comes to uh, traumatizing some uh, a person. Trauma, traumatizing my, my little <laughs> sister. Uh, my little sister and I were seven years apart in age. And um, I've uh, pretty much grown up with a love of horror. And I used to uh, torment her, I guess, more or less, um, unintentionally with um, Tales from the Crypt. Um, mm -hmm. she's, like, she's, like, terrified of the Crypt Keeper. Like, she can't look at him. She can't listen to his laugh. She can't do, like, any of that. And then... Um, I used to watch a lot of zombie movies um, and play video games with zombies in them and stuff like that. And when they would come running at the screen, she'd start screaming and stuff. And so, yeah. I would say video games also had a huge impact on me. Once I started getting into like uh, Resident Evil and all those types of games, that's when I was like, okay, yeah, no, this is for me. Like now. Now I'm getting more creative because I'm figuring all these different ways to kill zombies and I'm, I'm seeing it, I'm playing it, so I'm able to be like, okay, if you go in this room, like, you know, some scary shit's going to happen. And that really, that really helped actually define some of my writing. My brother actually wasn't the video game type. It was, it was more me than introduced him to as I got older. Um, but yeah, no, he tormented me like that too. Tales of the Crypt for me, though, was exciting and funny. Until you get into, like, your 30th episode, and he laughs, and you're just like, would you please stop fucking laughing? Like, can you just introduce the show and then continue on? Like, I, it's like when Spawn came out on HBO, the only reason I'd watch that show is because I'd wait for Todd McFarlane to say, now turn off your lights, and then that'd make me laugh. I mean, the show is fantastic, but The Crypt Keeper, I loved it, I loved it, I loved it, and as I got older, I was like, okay, this is... He's not scary anymore. He's almost like a comedic character to me. Like, that's, that's the kind of twisted, like, brain I had when I was little. And, um, actually, a funny story about that. My mom, on my 12th birthday, Stosh and I convinced her. We had, like, a small group of friends. And my, we had a single screen theater in this small town. So my mom brought us to the theater to see Private Parts at Howard Stern. Have you ever seen that? Yes. Yep. Yeah, so I'm 12 years old. We're sitting in the theater. And my mom's absolutely pissed off at this point. Because she says we tricked her, even though she sat there and watched the whole goddamn movie and then told me it was good at the end. And then we brought her to the video store, and she's like, okay, now you guys can rent a movie. So we rent to Natural Born Killers. And we're 12 years old. We all watched this movie. And to me, it was just, it was nothing. It was more of a, this was just a great film. I just, uh, I never really saw fear in films like that. I always saw, like, this is a really good outlet for not... It's not a good outlet to be like, I want to go murder people. But, I mean, it's a good outlet to be like, you know, there's different sides of life. Not everything is rainbows and flowers sometimes. You know, there are some evil people out there. And I don't know. It never scared me. I never. I don't consider myself an evil person. But, you know, sometimes you got to think like an evil person the right like I do. So it's not something I'm too scared of. My, my brother tried his best. I mean, he used to jump around corners and wear masks and shit like that. But, I mean, that was more just, like I said, exciting to me. I was never really... One of the, the cringe at anything that was scary. Right. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think. I My first horror game that I can remember ever playing was Resident Evil 2. And then I just fell in love with the horror genre on video games. My, in, my introduction to horror movies was Bram Stoker's Dracula at the age of like 7 or 8 for me. And... Yeah, I mean, I've just been a big fan ever since. Um, I, w I tend to watch horror more than any other genre, but then again, I'm very picky on every genre anyway. I n normally stick to horror, comedy, and maybe some action, but not a whole lot. Yeah, my, uh, my girlfriend tends to stick to comedy, and the ho actually what I do find horrifying about that is I have to hear a lot of Sandra Bullock quotes, which absolutely scared the shit out of me. But last night I showed her Tucker and Dale versus Evil and Great how movie. absolutely disgusting the violence is in that movie, but how funny it is at the same time. So I mean I'm like I'm picky with movies too when it comes to certain genres and 
I don't know. Sometimes I like to throw on Hobo with a Shotgun, or sometimes I like to watch, you know, Halloween and have a good time. And then there's times where I really want to get right into that dark side where you show someone a film, and after they're done watching it, they uh, maybe not speak to you again, or just look at you like you 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 might have to speak to somebody if this is the kind of shit you're watching in your spare time. Mm. But I mean, it's not. This genre is not for everybody. Oh no, no, but. A lot of interesting film that will probably make people want to vomit or whatever is like the film from Unearth Films. If you ever heard of them, they make some very mm. disturbing, disgusting films. Well, and, oh, go ahead. It's 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 like the first time I saw Hostel when that came out. I was uh, I was in the city. So I must have been about sixteen, seventeen. Maybe a little bit older. And I remember thinking, like, okay, now we're back to, like, you know, getting that torture, disgusting, actual physical gore that we didn't really get a lot in the 90s. 90s were absolutely, you know, the birth of, like, independent, like, Tarantino and Boyle and all them. And even though Boyle went on to make 20 Days Later, which I absolutely love. Um, mm. But then we got back into that stuff in the early 2000s, and I was like, hey, it's, it's finally going back. And nowadays, like, you watch um, the Serbian film. And you watch it, and everyone's like, oh my god, this is absolutely terrible. And then you, there's a director's cut, and then there's an unrated cut, and there's an absolute nuts, completely wide open cut. And it's like these movies that we're just completely able to watch in 2005 nowadays are banned, or you can't find them, or you have to order special editions, or they're made by small independent companies. And it's just not in the vein like it used to be where big production houses or even midside or they're like you know how they would have like searchlight or you know they'd have a smaller you know sister or brother company they would make these like terrifying gory films and now you just find them really in the independent circuit you can't really find them produced on like a mass scale which uh which is nice because the independent directors and stuff they're ones that are really keeping it alive so i can appreciate that yeah, I mean, I guess, I forget how long ago it really was, but I know it's probably been like maybe four or five years, but, you know, we started to see that switch from physical media to digital stuff, and with the digital world now, we got, like, you know, the streaming services, whether it be movies, like Netflix or like Spotify for music or whatever, and you know we get the idea that bec that the cost of production is going up, but it also feels like for people like myself who would rather hold the box art and actually hold a copy of it, it just seems like it may be. I don't know the like, right word right now, but I guess maybe in the next maybe 10 years, we may not see that much physical media anymore when it comes to really anything, whether it be books, music, or movies. So it's just kind of, um, I don't know, it's just kind of sad, I guess, because there's a couple movies that I really enjoy, and I can't even get a physical copy, and... Everybody knows with, like, a digital copy, yeah, it's nice and whatever, but whoever owned the digital copies of it at any point in time can take it down and, and completely screw you over unless you somehow manage to f keep it, whether it being on your computer or find a way to download it, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not trying to say, like, download illegally, but I'm saying, like, I know some sites allow you to download, like, the file itself. Yeah, like, you know, when you're talking about iTunes and, like, a lot of people don't read those disclaimers that basically you don't own any of the content. So, yeah, you're right. If they do end up taking it down, you lose all your shit, which is annoying. And also, the other part about that, too, is if it depends on the production house. Like, I remember buying season passes the TV shows and not getting my show the next day and wondering, like, what the hell's going on? And then I'd call them, and I'd be like, it's been four or five days. like And they'd say, well, Warner Brothers decided not to give it to us yet. 
And I was like, well, I, I paid 50 bucks for this so I can have this thing. And they're like, well, you don't own it. So basically, you just have to wait. And yeah, no, with digital content nowadays, it's, uh, yeah, you're right. If you don't own a physical copy of this stuff, it, it could be something that's gone in a decade. The thing about that is it's like everything, too. Like, I grew up in a time where I don't know if you're a wrestling fan, but I grew up in a time where wrestling had, like, the greats, in my opinion, like, you know, The Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin and stuff like that. It's just, like, the horror genre, when you have when you have those, like, Wes Craven and, you know, the body horror of D David Cronenberg, and you have all these giant directors that are making these things, even Spielberg doing Jaws, like, giving a 27-year-old Jewish guy, you know, $20, $20 million to tell him to go make a movie, and that's what he comes back with. It's like, you had those masters making these movies, so whenever they'd release them, you'd go see them because you knew you are going to have the shit scared out of you. And nowadays, like I said, it's more independent, so you don't know who's making this stuff, and then they release it, and everyone immediately is like, no. Like, uh, Human Centipede 2, that's actually been banned in a lot of different places and that's what it's it's hard now because we don't have the faith that we had in the directors and the production houses when we would see like you know Wes Craven's doing another scream or like you know when uh Carpenter was doing like the thing and stuff of like horror movies like that where you're like hey I'm ready to watch this because I've seen his movies and I'm willing to like put myself through this because I know it's going to be good with the story as long and and the gore, but nowadays it's basically if it's not shock value or something that's completely hardcore, not a lot of people get behind it. And with the digital content, yeah, I know it's um now that we're not back into the VHS DVD, not even really the Blu-ray era anymore. It's just yeah, if you don't you don't have a physical copy of all that old stuff, they just keep ripping it down. And it's almost like we're digressing in time. It's like it was one point where. Like books I read nowadays, like you know, Catch from the Rye was banned, and nowadays it's taught in school, right? It's just, it's going to take another, I don't know, probably twenty years till it picks up big. This, these last three years have been great for horror. They got to remember they made that Halloween Halloween remake, and I think they, I don't know, eighty million dollars, and that thing brought in almost a, a billion dollars. I think it was like eight hundred million or something like that. So I mean, like they are seeing the value in it. Like it is increasing, like with uh, Jordan Peele making his movies and things like that. But it just doesn't have the same appeal. It's more they're trying to say now. Like I've been reading a lot of magazines and interviews now where they're actually using the word thriller instead of horror, which uh, I found quite odd. Yeah, I started to notice that too, especially with some interviews from the Fangoria issue that I have, and I don't know how I feel about that, but. But I, I, maybe it's because they're losing the touch of what horror actually is. Um, I mean, <clears throat> um, I forget who it was. I think it was actually my fiance and I. We were talking with, I think, a friend of ours. And we were mentioning how it seems like the U.S. has become so soft when it comes to making horror films that we need to rely on, like, the foreign country just to get our originality, per se, because, you know, they're, like, I mean, anything Japan is going to be goddamn scary because they can, they pull it off re really well. And, like, there's stuff from, like, French, or from France, I should say, like, Martyrs, that's what, 2008, 2009, that, that movie is fucking brutal. And then the U.S. had to take their dirty claws and make their own U.S. version of Martyrs, which completely fucks up the entire idea of the French version. And one of the most brutal scenes of the movie is, like, so watered down in the U.S. version that I just found the U.S. version to be so goddamn fucking pathetic. And then we look at, like, uh, what is it, the Spanish version of Wreck, which in the U.S. version is Quarantine, where the first one is mainly shot per, shot by shot, uh, darker than the original, and then we get, like, Wreck 2 and Quarantine 2, and Quarantine 2 is just like, what the hell, while Wreck 2 was actually following the story, and yeah, I just, I don't know, I... I, I just think you, the U.S. is really just not 
care and what they really do. I mean, look, look how many films they started the remake, and look how many remakes we got coming. So yeah, Ugh. yeah. No, it's it was like that even in the past. So in like France and Italy, like the Italians of the Gallo era and Fellini, and a lot of these pe- horror directors that we got in Canada and the U.S. and like the '90s and 2000s, like would always rely on that because you're right. It was always the international movies that weren't afraid to push the boundaries. Like even like Cannibal Holocaust and stuff like that. And in Korea, um, one of my favorite directors, I always pronounce his name wrong, but Takeshi Mikke, I believe, is he Korean or is he? No, he's Japanese. And I love Itchy the Killer, Audition, stuff like that. And you watch those films and you're just like, oh my, this would never fly. Like no no American or Canadian would make this film. There's just no way. I, w- I had to order it from Japan for $90 and it came in a blood bag and no stores would sell it and then i found one little video store that would order it for me and that's the only way i can get it and yeah north american films um the u.s and canada well you know quebec's there quebec is always fucked up in canada but it's we still have a little you have to find an audience it's like terrifier have you seen that yeah uh, no wait no not yet no well i mean it's it's absolutely brutal you've seen it no it's on our list of movies to watch it's been recommended to us by um courtney um akbar akbar yeah it's um it's on netflix it's see it found an audience because but i mean it's it's there are some scenes in that that even i was like oh my god i, I can't believe this got a quality check like i can't i can't there i had to turn my head a few times i was like, i can't eat this is pretty it, it deserves it, it's title is suiting for the movie that's for sure and one of the Festivals I got into um, is actually my hometown of London, Ontario, in Canada, down south. And um, Damien Leon is going to be there. And so is um, David Howard Thornton. He plays Art the Clown. They're actually going to have him in his just plain form. And they're going to show us all the special effects makeup until they make him Art the Clown and show us how to do special effects and things of that nature. But that movie was absolutely... A movie that was released in the last, well, I think it was last year, that I watched, and I was like, "Holy shit! Like this, this is outrageous! I can't believe that they're the reviews on are fantastic." And that's when I started realizing, you know, there's still there's still an audience for this stuff. There's still you can think outside the box and make films as long as you can find an audience. And the United States and Canada, they just unfortunately found their audience in that PG thirteen thriller area, not quite that rated R gory shit that everyone actually really wants and i don't know why they did that you write all these remakes you watch them and they're just so toned down and it's not even just toned down the gore it's like the story it's just you're just like this is this is like watching like the b version the shitty version of something i used to like and now i now i don't even like the original now and thanks for fucking that up and yeah no i do rely heavily on older movies or international movies nowadays to actually get even somewhere close to being like, okay, this is this is scary, instead of just having those pop up scares like the nun or things like that. That's funny that you mentioned the um, the ratings of films because <clears throat> to, <clears throat> to answer that question about the whole why they kind of started to do the PG thirteen, it's kind of simple. It's because why would you want to make a rated R film, right? Just for seventeen and up. Or, cause, but I don't know how it works in Canada, so I don't know if it's, it's the same as the U.S. or not, but you can clarify with me after. But uh, I know with Rated R here, it's like 17 and up. PG-13 is like 13 and up, sometimes with a parental guardian if needed or whatever, kind of like with Rated R. But um, the idea is, well... Why would you want to go see a rated R film if you're like 13 years old where you need to get your parents permission, but now with PG-13, if you're 13 years old, now you can just go and not have to worry about permission. So it's one of those cash grabs to try to reach more of an audience rather than just one specific age group. Yeah, no, I, that, that's exactly what it is. It's, it's easier... you. You throw in $50 million into a movie, you're not going to get it back that's rated R. Like, the fact that Halloween did that was because it had a following. But that's why these rated R movies nowadays are being made for 
two million, five million dollars. I mean, the Soska sisters are remaking Cronenberg's Rabbit, and I think they got fifty million for that. And that that right there is a huge gamble alone. In Canada, actually, the uh, funny thing about that is, in the early two thousands, we sort of had the same rating system as the United States. Now it's a lot lighter. Um, what you guys find rated R will probably get a fourteen A rating on it. Um, something that's rated R in Canada that's eighteen plus, it, it has to have certain content, not necessarily gore, but um, maybe like a child really? getting hurt or sexual assault, things of that nature. But in Canada, it's a lot more lenient when it comes to ratings. Um, I remember in, in two uh, when I don't know when the first Kill Bill came out two thousand two thousand one. I was I was I was 18 because I was born in April and my high school girlfriend was born in December so she's still 17 and we went with a group of friends and we all got carded and we were all allowed in except for her and I had to miss the movie and I was super pissed off about that that was like the point where I was like do I dump this girl right here in the movie line and go see Kill Bill that I really want to see or you know keep this girl but. In Canada, the rating, yeah, the rating system is completely different. Like, I, I just rented The Outsiders today, and it had an 18-plus Canadian rating on it. I was like, I don't remember this movie being that bad, that it had to have an 18-plus rating on it. Like, Taxi Driver itself, it, it's an 18-plus in Canada, too. I just rented those movies today. I haven't seen them in a while. But no, um, like, The Matrix in the United States is rated R, is it not? I remember when it came out, it was rated R, but when it came out here, it was, I think now it's PG. Like, the shit they show on TV now um, is, used to be stuff I used to get carded for if I had to go watch it in the movie theater in Canada anyways. Canada's pretty lenient on its movie ratings. Hmm. Um, actually, we can see if I can look up right now for The Matrix. I want to say that was rated R. Um, I believe at one point it was the highest grossing rated R movie, and then it was 300. And then... I think we're back to Halloween now. I, I have no idea what the... Or Passion of the Christ would be the highest rating, grossing radar movie. Or, and then right after that would be Deadpool, I think. But... I could see... Yeah, no, I believe The Matrix came out as rated R, but now it's basically, to today's standards, like PG, PG-13. Yeah. Um, God, I'm not... I'm not seeing the rating, which is weird. Oh, there it is. Here we go. I had to go on Amazon to look for it. Yeah, The Matrix is rated R. Yeah, I remember that. I remember when it came out, it was rated R. Yeah, and then... What was Matrix Reloaded? That was also rated R. And then wasn't there one more uh, Matrix? We got The Matrix. Yeah, there was the... Uh, what was it? Reloaded. And yeah. then... I don't remember what the last Matrix was. I remember I didn't like it, I can tell you that much. Um, Revolution. There it is. Revolution, I would say. Yeah, they kind of rushed those last two there. I think they took one movie and split it into two, and I don't really think they knew what they were doing with it. Um, oh. Yeah, they not, definitely... not my favorite movie, anyway. <laughs> yeah, yep. Yeah. So all the Matrix were definitely rated R, just to throw it out there, yeah. So... But another thing we noticed with movies, or at least I have, I don't know about you, but there's some now where because of that whole political correctness bullshit came in, where they ended up like having to go back and re-edit Star Wars and make it political correct. So, yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah, like, like who shot first, and I remember when that happened, that was... Uh... There, there are no worse fans on this planet than, than Star Wars fans. They, they, they bitch about everything. It, yep. And I mean, for for great reason. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a large franchise. I understand. I mean, it's one of the biggest influences in film of all time. I understand that much. But holy, like I, I thought I like you know I, I stick to like the horror community and I, I listen like we you know I've seen people be like, oh that movie's a piece of shit or this isn't good or. I, you're stupid for liking this, but those Star Wars fans, they will literally try and eat each other. That, oh, yeah. that, is, that is a different beast on its own. <clears throat> oh, yeah. I, I don't know who's worse, Star Wars or Star Trek fans. 
<laughs> oh, I know. It's it's crazy. It's almost like they would start a war on their own if they ever all got together. And like, if the Star Wars fans were able to organize an army, and then the Star Trek fans were able to organize an army, there would be absolute chaos on this on this planet. Pretty soon, they're gonna ban hashtag Star Wars. <laughs> Pretty much. Pretty much. And then I know with the latest Disney film, nobody's really too impressed lately. Uh, at least with the last ones, anyway, they weren't too impressed. But now we got the upcoming Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker, or whatever. So, yeah, I just saw that teaser the other day there. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. Maybe it could help bring back the franchise, I don't know. I've kind of lost interest in the Star Wars universe after uh, Star Wars number three. Oh, that, that's the weird thing about me is I actually, I, um, going back to Stosh, he, he, he was a mega Star Wars fan. He, uh, he had all the toys, which uh, him and I were making movies when we were eight years old. The first one, his parents bought the first digital camera, and uh, we were able to make stop motion movies with all the Star Wars figures. And I, I came from like a DC background. Like I, I like even now as like a like a horror fan who makes horror movies. Like I have like a Batman sleeve on my arm, and I, I grew up on Batman and all that entire Gotham City shit. And he grew up on Star Wars. So I mean, we had very different views. We liked a lot of the same movies, but we would get as soon as he went on Star Wars, and I'd start putting it down. And that's when we were we weren't friends that day, but. No, he he was he's probably the biggest Star Wars fan I know. He huge Star Wars fan. I don't like and the thing about the last one too is they got um Rain Johnson. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's directed some of my favorite movies and the fact that they were pissed off that that's the director they got, I was like, gee, you, there's no pleasing you people. There's there there's no pleasing Star Wars fans. No matter what you do, they get everything they want. It's like, no, not good enough. I should have wrote that movie. And it's like, you know, who the hell are you to say something like that? It's like when you watch that new Halloween movie and people are like, oh, it didn't stay true to the original. It's like, well, I mean, that was like, Christ, 30 years ago. What do you mean it didn't stay true? It's a completely different movie now. Like those Marvel movies and people complain that it wasn't the same story as a comic book. It's just, with theater movies now, it's, it's just blockbusters. It's all action and that's what sells. And pretty soon we're going to see the fall of huge Cineplex and giant theaters like that where back in the day you were able to go to a theater and you know you watch the exorcist or the shining and that would be the greatest movie you've seen that year and nowadays if it doesn't have iron man in it no one's really paying to go see it right <laughs> that's the hardest thing about being in the horror genre well that can work in the horror genre as well where you know if people listen to fans then it can either a make a great horror film or it can backfire depending on what it is so i mean kind of like with uh since you mentioned video games uh, so when red barrel games they reached out to the fans and they were asking about what did they like with the original outlast that they would work on with Outlast 2, and somebody must have had said they loved to run away from everything because that's all Outlast 2 was, was just running a marathon. And yeah, I like. <laughs> I, I just recently played those games not too long ago, actually. They, how did I, you... I remember um, what was it? when they made that Friday the 13th one, and they just got not, I don't think, I think it's still going. But um, they can't make any new content because one of the art directors on the third movie didn't give the rights to a certain outfit or something, and they got completely fucked on that one. And now I play that. Uh, sometimes I play that um, Dead by Daylight. I'll play that. I'll always be the killer. And that that the, like, the games like that are still fun. Outlast is good. Um, Remother that just came out. That's what I mean. And that virtual reality that uh, Resident Evil. Seven? Yep. I believe it was? Yep. That game was terrifying. And that woman crawled up the stairs, I, I think I shit my pants. That that was the scariest experience I've ever had, actually, was playing that game. Yeah, you're talking um, the old lady, I believe, right? Going up the stairs? I think that's who it was. Uh, when, you, when you first save your girlfriend there, and then she comes up oh. back as a zombie thing. Yep, 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 yep. 
Okay. Yeah, yeah, I didn't play it in VR at first, so I wasn't really sure why everyone was freaking out about it. And I got a VR headset, and I was playing it, and I was like, oh, this is a completely different game when you have the VR headset on. Oh, yeah. And I was thinking about doing that, too, like immersive horror films and horror movies, and I was hoping that was kind of the direction it was going into, but the, like you are saying, like, and it just seems to be going downhill, so I don't really see them making any real immersive, scary horror films. That's the last thing they're going to do now after all the backlash from the media and social media on the horror genre is just absolutely getting ridiculous at this point yeah I, I don't know i don't know what i'm starting to think of the horror community sometimes because yeah i just don't know I, it's just crazy with what we see that being out there for news wise and um uh, yeah, I'm just not even gonna go into it. It's just one of those clutter fucks that's going that goes around and comes around kind of thing. But um, so, Doug, real quick, um, to kind of go back to like your bipolaroid and stuff, and um, since you deal with like bipolar yourself, um, what kind of advice would you give somebody that trying to start out, maybe wanting to write their own short story or want to create an own movie or create their own movie well the the best thing to do first is uh is to start with a short film there was a gentleman i was talking to that asked me like if he should go balls deep into a feature and see if he can do it or start off in a short film and i told him you should start off in a short film because there's a difference between being on set and you have three, four days to film something that's five minutes and, you know, messing up along the way, but you're learning. And there's a difference between jumping into a feature and then absolutely feeling defeated and not, not being prepared to do something of that nature. But writing a story, my best advice, and it's probably the best advice I was given as well, is you always write for your smartest audience. Um, don't go as far as to put shit in there that, you know, you think is smart or only you get thinking that there's one person out there that's going to get it. I mean, you still have to make it commercial friendly. But, yeah, always write for your smartest audience. Don't assume the audience is stupid because as soon as you do that, they, they can sniff out authenticity. And if you're not writing who you are, you're not writing, you're not writing truly just, you're not, you're not feeling it. Like, I wouldn't go write a romance movie. It, it wouldn't work. I had... I'd, I'd fuck it up. Even if Warner Brothers was like, oh, you $10 million to rewrite Pretty Woman, I'd just tell them, like, I'm sorry, it's not even trying to be rude. I'd probably just fuck that movie right up for you guys. Like, you, you wouldn't make any money on it. So, like, the audience, they, they can sniff out when you're not being real. So I tell people, like, you know, when you're writing, you don't always have to write what you know. I don't find that to be the best advice. People always say, like, write what you know, write what you're familiar with. And, I mean, when you're starting off, it's, it's good to do stuff like that. Um... But when you get in that habit of just writing what you know, you just get in the habit of writing about yourself and writing about past experiences, and now you're writing more life than you are entertainment. So what I tell people is write for your smartest audience. Make sure that there is a piece of you in the story that you can relate to. Like, yeah, like in Bipolaroid, you know, there's parts of me where I'm trying to tell people, like, no, I'm not writing films like this because I'm you know, mentally ill, I'm writing films like this because I chose to, this is who I am, this is what I write, but at the same time, am I killing people with the camera? No. Um, it's like Lars von Trier, when uh, I was listening to him talk about the ha a house that Jack built, and there's a scene in that where um, Matt Dillon's character, Jack, kills a woman, and then he goes to leave the house, but he has to keep going back in, because he keeps thinking that he left blood somewhere, and he keeps cleaning the same spot over and over again. And Lars von Trier said, you have no idea how close that is to my real life. And everyone like, kind of looked at him. He's like, no, not killing people. Just like sometimes I'll be cleaning and then I'll think to myself, like, oh, I forgot that part and I'll go back and clean it. And that's what I mean about putting yourself into a film. It's like, yeah, you write what you know as in, you know, really define your characters. Make sure you're doing characters. And another thing is to no production house or no producer wants to invest in someone that's writing a script in between Xbox games or Call of Duty rounds. You... You have to write your log line, your treatment, your outline. You have to write your character descriptions. You have to make sure you go all in. If you're just in there, you open up cell text or final draft or reviews and you jump into it and you write it and you just pump off your first draft and start sending it to people, you're going to look like a jackass. It's the best to really put time in the development, pre-production. That's where I spend the most of my time. So when I get on set, I'm not 
sitting there with my dick in my hand, staring at everyone, not knowing what's going on. And it's not to say that you can't rewrite during production, but I mean, work hard. And I, like I tell everyone, and I believe Muhammad Ali said the best, is every time you're not practicing or every time you're not training, someone else out there is. When you meet that person, they're going to beat you. So every day, write an hour, even if it's a day that you're feeling shitty or even if it's not even about the film that you're writing the day before, just sit down and write an hour a day. Get it out of you. Always be improving yourself. And just remember, you're writing movies, and you can cheat a little bit, too. That's the, that's the, that's the best thing about movies, is that you can have shit in there that doesn't quite make sense, but the audience, they still are able to create some kind of reality around this fantasy because we're so exposed to theater and cinema and comic books and novels and fiction that we expect there to be a little bit of leeway like is there a robotic cop that can go around and you know blow people's arms off no there isn't but if there was this is what would happen so i mean think outside the box be yourself write what you know to a certain extent i mean if you're going to go write a film on you know brain surgery and you just don't look it up and you just happen to start right making shit up you're probably not going to do a good job but the best advice is write for your smartest audience. Don't think the audience is stupid. As soon as you do that, they'll uh, they'll turn on you pretty quick. Oh yeah, oh yeah. The fan can definitely tell when you're trying to portray something towards the audience, trying to make us look stupid. We're gonna definitely point that out. And even if you're like you just said, like writing something about brain surgery and you're just guessing on how it works rather than researching it. Oh, yeah, we're going to know. We're going to know you're screw up and fuck up and everything. And unless you somehow try to make it believable. But then in that in that case, you got to really make it believable to really hide the, the the falseness, I guess, within the lines, I guess, would be the best way to put it. But, yeah, I mean, I could go on about that, but, yeah. No, the hardest thing, too, for writers and even novelists is just actually putting your work out there. It's, it takes a lot of balls to do something like that, a lot of guts to uh, make a piece and put it out there because there's, no matter what, it's not 100% everyone's on your side. Like, you know, the people that love you and support you, you got that, but there are going to be a group of people out there, they're going to come after you, and you just got to be prepared for it, and a lot of people fear that. And I don't blame them because it gets scary after a while. I mean, even this author that I'm working with now, and probably not this summer, next summer, we're thinking about collaborating on something with his, but even he, when he was handing it to me, was kind of like, you know, oh, do your own vision. He's very passive, very, very willing to give up a lot of his ideas that were in the book that meant a lot to him and had a lot of subtext in his life at one point where he was just like, oh, yeah, you know, just try and make it your own vision. I'm like, well, you know, I plan to do that. That's where I want to be a really good director. But people get very uncomfortable right away when they start thinking like, okay, I, I wrote this sort of personal piece and now I'm about to show it to a bunch of people. And there's always that one person in, to you who's going to be an asshole, but really they just don't like your stuff. Not, not everything is for everybody, right? But yeah, just putting your stuff out there too. If you write it, you're, like I said, your first one's not going to be your best one. Your first one should always, though, this is another good piece of advice. The first thing when you start getting out of shorts, you start getting out of the habit of just writing for the sake of writing, and you actually go to do a project, is always work your first project as your passion project. If I meet a producer or a director and they have four or five movies under their belt, and they're talking to me like they're big. And then you find out, now one of them was their passion project, just so happened they bumped into this person, and they wanted to make a film about toilet seats, so they did. And then this person bumped into them, and they wanted to make a film about scary dolls, so they did. I started thinking, like, okay, well, there's a difference between being an artist and just being a person that's in it, not even just for the money, just for the sake of being able to do it. So... Yeah, try and always make your first project your passion passion project, or you'll end up being really pissed off with life. Like David Fincher when he made Alien Three, like it wasn't the best Alien, but um, Fox really micromanaged him to the point where he he quit film. He went back to making music videos, and luckily we got him back where he wouldn't have Zodiac and Fight Club, Panic Room. So I mean, it's very defeating when you put yourself out there and. A lot of people shit on you, but that's just unfortunately how the business works, right? So it takes a lot of guts to do something like that. And 
my best advice is just go ahead and swing for the fences because not everyone's going to like you. Yep, that is true. Um, so, Doug, where can people um, view uh, Bipolaroid? Bipolaroid? <laughs> Currently nowhere. Um, it's still on, it's still in the film festival circuit. So I was official selection in um, first time filmmaker. Why I got that was because I'm a film student and Shockstock. It get it will be in London, Ontario, April 26th. They're gonna have a live viewing of that. On it's nowhere online. Um, a lot of festivals that I applied for, you can't have any public viewing. Um, like, you know, a lot of people do that too. There's another piece of advice. You make a film, don't go upload it to YouTube unless you expect just to have it on YouTube, right? When a festival won't take it, if they already know that a million people have seen it. Um, right now, it's basically just the people I've sent it to for review. I've done a couple of podcasts. I've done um, a couple of Q&As, things of that nature. I, like I said, I have a lot of other material that I still haven't even released yet. Um, I'm not that weirdo that, like, holds on to their projects and doesn't show them, but... As of now, once it gets out of the film circuit, I'll probably throw it up on Vimo and YouTube and start my channels and get everything going. Like I said, I like I was right afraid of this. I was audio mixing my last film that I just got done about, I think we filmed it at the end of February, and I'm still editing that. Um, and this summer, we're going to shoot a feature. It's going to be the first feature we're going to shoot. And I don't know. I keep my art really close. I'm one of those people that... If it doesn't turn out the way I want it, like I'd, I'd feel completely comfortable just trashing it. And with bipolar, I was almost like that. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to put this one aside. I'll shelf it, and I'll come back to it later on. And one of my film teachers, um, like I said, I'm a mature student. I'm not trying to date myself, but they they work with me, and they're like, listen, like you know, just no one else is making this shit as a film student. So go ahead and like put it out. Just it's not the best that you can do, but just go ahead and put it out for now. And that's why I tell people to start off in shorts because you start being able to get your own feel and vibe and then people start to know who you are and enjoy your films. But as of now, there's just going to be a few. Um, in the UK, Pinewood Studio, um, competing with a few there to see if it's going to be viewed there. Down at Shockstock in London, Ontario, will be viewed on the 26th. And then... Hopefully, deep cut film festival in Kitchener, more type B, type C film festivals. But until all the live screenings are done, then I'll release it online. I have um, another question. I'm kind of curious. What are you, like your top three favorite horror movies, and why? Oof. <laughs> I think about that all the time. I, I always know I'm going to be asked that, and I'm like, okay, they're going to ask. Every time I do a podcast or dinner, they're always gonna ask me what uh, what my favorite horror movies are, and I think to myself, okay. Recently, and I don't know if you define this as a horror movie, and he is quickly becoming um, one of my favorite directors. Is Yorgos? Um, oh, let me get his last name here. So I probably can't even pronounce his last name. He's uh, he's Greek, but was killing of a sacred deer. Um, Yorgos Lanthimos. That movie was absolutely terrifying, but it was played out so deadpan drama that it didn't really get the recognition it should have got. That was that was my film where I was like, yeah, this is this is what I expect the path for horror to go in. So I'd go with Killing of a Sacred Deer would be my most recent modern favorite horror film. I would I would define it in that genre. My favorites definitely Cronenberg's movies. Um I would have to go with uh, Rabid, the original Rabid. I'm a huge Cronenberg fan. And then I'd have to go with my my absolute favorite horror movie. That's, that's a hard question. That's like... I There's so many good ones. I'll go Killing of Sacred Deer, Rabid, and then at the very front runner of that, the one I probably watched the most would be I wouldn't even call it a horror movie. I was going to say Videodrome, but maybe Shivers. I like Shivers because it was so independent, and I like the story around That's also a Cronenberg film from the 70s, made in Canada. So Shivers, Rabid, and Killing of a Sacred Deer would be my, probably the top three that I'd suggest people to watch nowadays, for sure. Wow. I like those choices. 
I haven't seen them. I have a very different taste, yeah. Yeah. They're definitely different, but, I mean, very good choices. I was surprised Rabbit went into it. So, wow. Haven't heard that title in forever. Um, no, I know. I'm really excited to see the remake. Actually, the Soska sisters and I had a little uh, social media social media battle there for a bit until I was really disappointed that they were remaking that movie. Um, they're just certain directors. Like, I'm not one of those fans who are like, oh, you can't remake Evil Dead. I mean, you can, but it's just the original will never die, right? Like, it's like you can remake that movie a thousand times. It doesn't matter. Nothing will beat the original. But when you start remaking, like, Lynch films or Cronenberg films or, you know, like, Kubrick films, when that shit starts happening, that's when you're like, okay, you know, you don't remake pieces of art. It's like, no one's going to repaint the Mona Lisa. Just leave that alone for a while. That's when it starts pissing me off. So, yeah, we uh, we exchanged words there for a bit, and they're Canadian as well. That's, uh, and usually I'm a huge supporter of Canadian cinema, even though uh, no one really gets anywhere with it, but I'm a huge supporter of Canadian cinema, and I was still really upset to hear that. And, uh, but yeah, Rabid, Rabid's still probably one of my top favorites. I, I watch that a lot. One, uh, I've recently seen a Canadian film called Darken, and then there's an older film from Canada that I watched. I forget how. I, I was given the DVD. I don't know how this person g g ha even got a copy of it, but it was called UKM, which stood for Ultimate Killing Machine. I don't know if you ever heard of that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I wouldn't know how someone did get a copy of that. I, I don't know, but I actually still have the DVD copy of uh, The Ultimate Killing Machine <laughs> in my uh, DVD collection. So that was really interesting of a, of their take of, if I remember the movie right, the like ultimate soldier, almost like the uh, that one yeah. movie. That, God damn it, now I just forgot the name of it now. Shit. What is it called? Like Ultimate Soldier, the one with Goldberg in it? And he's like, oh, oh, um... Universal, is the Universal Soldier? Yes. Van Damme? Yes, yes. I'm gonna, I really hate that guy or whatever with Goldberg. Yeah. That was so funny. Uh, the good old days. Uh, yeah. Well, oh, yeah, Darken. You just, you just yeah. watched that. Yeah, Darken. That, that was, was a really movie. good one. That was uh, a really crazy movie. Oh, yeah. The practical effect is probably like a really well done one. Too. And shit, I don't think that was Canada. Fuck, I'm gonna have to look. Darken? Up. No, not not that one. The one I know Darken is, but there's another one I'm trying to think of, and I don't remember if it's Canadian or not. It's called The Void. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know why that's just that's so funny. You just said that. I was just waiting for you to stop talking to. Um, not actually <laughs> bothering me. I was just waiting to mention that because uh, that was actually filmed where I live currently. Yep. Yeah, that's yeah. kind of cool. And um, the thing, I have a funny story about that, actually. There's some film students. Um, so what happens, I live in a really small community. I think it's about 70,000 people. Um, just right across from Michigan, actually. Like, you can literally throw a stone to Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. And I live in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. So there's a lot of abandoned buildings here. And one of them was a hospital. And then there was a school. So the void came here and they got... They got the abandoned hospital, and eventually they lost that location, so they went to the school. But they didn't tell anyone it was a monster movie, um, that there were monsters in the movie. And one of the kids from our college that got on there is, I think, a second unit camera assistant or, or grip or go for locate, location, something of that nature. Um, he took a picture of the practical effects and put it on Instagram. And our college got complete shit and had to be taken down that kid got fired and almost ruined that whole movie for those guys but you know what now that you mention that um i will i will make a fourth add-on to that list the void was probably one of the greatest films to come out in the last 10 years that that movie was absolutely amazing yeah i definitely dug the practical effects especially that one dude that can like uh, what that word I'm looking for contort his body all over the place. Yeah, body oh, yeah. contortionist. Yeah, yeah, that, that was that was great. Yeah, 
actually, I would say the best part of that movie was when uh, the guy tells uh, the cop's wife to uh, shut the fuck up, and the cop says, it's my special privilege to tell my wife to shut the fuck up. You don't get to say that. <laughs> and I was just like, even during a crisis, that guy's like, that's my special privilege. They're about to walk into a room and shoot monsters with a shotgun, and they still have time to lip each other off. It's writing like that, that uh, the horror genre is really missing that, you know, used to be good zingers back in the day. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. There's a lot we could really say about The Void. But at first, when I first thought of Void, I didn't really care for it. But I think that's because I would part deaf. So at the time, I'm like, I got to use subtitles sometimes. And unfortunately, we didn't have the option to have subtitles. Now we do. So we even tried watching it with subtitles. And something about it for, like, the second time around, I... um just could not get into the story, even though I loved the music, the practical effects, and everything about it, but, but then, um, I eventually just gave in and bought the Blu-ray, because I was just like, even though I may seem to hate on it, I still like the movie, because it, it's really well done, it really is. Have you seen Beyond the Gates? A long time ago, yeah. Actually, yeah. Yeah, it's like The well, Void and Beyond the Gates, they, they really brought back that 80s neon horror type of vision that we haven't seen for a long time. So they really brought back the nostalgic feeling of watching a horror movie, like say like, Re like you know, Reanimator or, or um, From Beyond and stuff like that, or just like those 80 horror films that you're like, that were kind of outside of the box. That's why they were good. The Void is... It's a confusing movie to get behind, and then you see the ending, and you're kind of like, okay, this is open for a lot of interpretation. But even beyond the gates with the, the VHS games, I used to play those when I was a kid, right? So, I mean, I really resonated with that film, too. But they really had that color palette and those storylines. And, yeah, no, those those movies were good also because I think a lot of viewers may have not liked them, but they're like, this reminds me of a time where I actually used to enjoy movies. So, yeah, that's why I like The Void. That's The practical effects alone were pretty incredible. Right, right, right. Well, Doug, I don't want to keep uh, beating the the interview even more, but is there anything that we haven't mentioned that you would like to mention about either bipolaroid or anything at all? Um, well, with bipolaroid, you know, it opened a lot of gates for me. I, I, uh, a lot of doors, I guess you can say. I, I really, I didn't think I was going to get away with it in school. Um, and once I did, I realized, okay, well, I can push it a little bit further. So this next one we're doing this summer here, that we're going to try and shoot the whole feature over the summer, it's going to be something a little bit more along the lines of a character study, but a lot more. Now I know that I can get away with a little bit of, if you show the to him in the proper way, and I, you know, I know the first time around it wasn't exactly how I wanted, but if you show the audience in a certain way something that they wouldn't want to see probably in real life, mind you, like, you know, a murder or something like that, you, you can get away with a lot. So this taught me kind of how to dance around the fact that you can trick people into enjoying something that actually really isn't enjoying, that they actually don't fulfill any kind of happiness in their life. They're still like, even my mom was like, oh, that was really nice. And I was like, that's bullshit, but I'll take the compliment. Um, <laughs> now that I know that I can do that, I, uh, I can do it. Actually, the only reason I went to film school, I've been doing this for a while. I actually was in Sault Ste. Marie. I was supposed to be visiting this city. Um, I'm pretty sure now I'm, I'm under the impression that it's purgatory and I'm, I, I've died somewhere else. And I've just been living in this city now for three years. Um, yeah. I actually was walking to work. I worked the night shift, and I was hit by a truck. And I had to, I was down for a while, so I had to find something else to do. So I was like, you know what, I'll go to film school. And like I said, now that it's 2019 and I'm in film school, I'm like, you know what, I'm going to be that person that, I'm going to start off really slow, but then I'm going to be that person that's not afraid to, you know, I'm not going to start doing like a James Gunn thing and making cancer jokes or anything like that, but uh, I'm going to be that person that tries to, make people see the shit they don't want to see anymore but still suggest it to their friends to go view it like you guys being told to go watch terrifiers like wait till you see that movie you're gonna be like oh my jesus 
Like someone, someone actually. There, there's some, there's some scenes in that that you literally you haven't seen anything like that for 20 years. I'll tell you that much right now. And that's what I plan on doing. So that's, that, I went really soft on the first one there, and now I'm starting to think like I'm getting the idea of how not to trick the audience, but to make them kind of on your side. Where I, I see where this guy's coming from. So that's that's probably a good thing that I learned from making that short film. Nice. Yeah, I can't wait. And um, just for, I guess just for the reference, have you actually seen the original film that Art the Clown was originally in before Terrifier? All Hallows Eve? Yep. Yeah, yeah really familiar with all those. Um. It's like James Wan making, uh, well, they call it, what, Saw Point Five when he did the short film there, The Head Trap. And yeah. that's, that's another thing, too. It's good to make short films because, like, by Polaroid, that was meant to be a short piece. That was never something that I wanted to develop any longer than it was. It was just a short message, pretty much. You know, there's a lot of people that were telling me, like, oh, no, you're fucked up because of this. And I was like, you know what, fuck you. I'm going to prove it now. And then, but there are, like, films like that, like you, uh, like Terrifier, you take... You make this short piece that almost plays out like a scene, and you throw it out there. And once you get an audience behind it, then you start shopping it around. That's a that's a really great way to break in the features. Just like Saw, um, well, Terrifier, and I know who else did that. Like uh, Thunder Road recently just did that. Um, yeah, that's a really good way to shop around too when you're writing a short film. So if you do have feature scripts that are kind of ridiculous and there's car explosions in them or, you know, you're chopping off someone's head and you're sitting there with 10 bucks in your pocket, use that 10 bucks to make a scene out of that movie and, you know, go and shop around with that. Don't make it like a preview. Make like a short out of it and then go use it to shop with. That's that's a good way of getting attention for yourself. Definitely. Nice. Now, um... Once again, Doug, uh, thank you for your time and for people that want to keep up to date with you, um, where can people find you or learn more about either the Bipolaroid or anything that is coming up, coming out from you? Well, I'm on all the, uh, major social media, um, Facebook. I, you know, I think it's at director Douglas Yoon and my Twitter's Douglas Yoon. My Instagram is Douglas A. Yoon. Everything's by my name. Um, I tend to post a lot of my work and uh, where you can find it, a lot of my own stuff, along with a lot of uh, usually violent movie clips. Um, but yeah, no, usually, usually right now on social media, I was starting up um, working with a production company. We had it going, but then I was getting more work as a director than I was actually wanting to produce movies. So yeah, just basically all the major social media, you'll find me around. Um, my next film will be complete and start circulating around April 23rd. It's called The Faults of Certainty. More of a nightmarish drama, like I said. And then this summer, we're going to try and get production going on. The Devil is Tired of Rushing Me, which hopefully gets completed. So, like I said, every, 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 couple, every week, I try and keep people up to date and just post and let them know what's happening. And that's really about it. Like I said, I'm one of those people that, like, I'm, like when you go and look up Quentin Tarantino stuff, if you're not finding interviews and stuff like that, he's not really pumping out a lot of advertising and stuff. It's not that I, I don't like it. It's just like with the hashtag whore being banned from Instagram and stuff, like that really fucked a lot of people over too, right? So, I mean, I'm trying to use social media, but at the same time now, it's just really a platform to let people follow me. So yeah, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you'll find me all over that. Awesome. Well, we'll definitely have to keep in touch, Doug, and um, looking forward to sure. anything that really comes up out of, from you too. And um, everybody that listening thank you so much for listening to this i hopefully you learned a lot about bipolaroid and learned a little bit more about doug and everything else and i mean it's a pleasure to learn and it's always hard to hmm i guess it's it's, it's always hard when you first trying to cope with bipolar until you re understand how to control it just like Doug here, and he may not seem angry all the time, but deep down inside, he he has a soul and a good heart, I believe. And I can't really yeah. say that 100%, but... <laughs> Thank you. That's usually what I'm told. Yeah, people always say, 
it's not like a tough guy act by no means. But people always say like, yeah, you make all this scary stuff, but deep down, you're a big softy. Yeah, I mean, so don't, everybody don't here. tell don't tell people that. <laughs> well, I'll try, I try. Uh, uh, did this everybody what I just said? Just don't don't. You did not hear that. I am telling you now to erase your ears at the end of the podcast. Yeah, la 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 la. But until then, <laughs> thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed. And if you're looking forward for more of Douglas, we got links in the description of how to keep in touch. And as always, everybody, stay scary.